You know, pandemic aside, 2020 has been a great year for watch lovers. Hi everyone and welcome to Shaluso and yes we are talking again about some new watch releases. But before I get started with that, I want to give you guys a quick reminder to leave your questions for my next Q&A episode in the comments below so I can incorporate those into my next Q&A episode that I'm planning. But let's talk about some of these new releases. It is August 29th as I film this so I'm not talking about the new Rolex releases because I haven't really come out yet and I already did a predictions video about that in March so no need to repeat that. Instead, I'm going to be talking about the new releases that have come out around the Geneva watch days for 2020. Now, there have been a bunch of different ones that came out, but there's three that I'd really like to highlight. And the first one is the H Moser & C Streamliner 3-hander. Earlier this year, we were introduced to the Streamliner collection from H Moser & C. It had this amazing chronograph, Agenor movement, everything linked on center seconds, no subdials, Fume grade dial and a completely unique integrated bracelet design that looked nothing like a Nautilus or a Royal Oak. It was very, very Moser and it had really, really good reception and it looks totally distinct. Well, now they've continued on that collection with a three-hander. And of course, Moser being Moser, they had to pick a cool dial for it and they gave it this gorgeous fume green. So while everyone's talking about, oh, will the Hulk be discontinued, oh no, we have an amazing green dial with this already. Honestly, I couldn't care less about what happens to the Hulk if this is the sort of future for green dials. So definitely a great move by Moser. And it's in continuation with what they were saying. They said this is a new collection. The Streamliner wasn't just a one-off. Edward Melan in an interview was saying that a lot of the reception they got from the original Streamliner chronograph was people who were in that sort of market for a Royal Oak or a Nautilus. They had the money for it. But they didn't want something that was so incredibly ubiquitous. At the end of the day, you don't get much of a feeling of exclusivity when in those sorts of circles, probably they see Royal Oaks and Nautiluses all the time. It doesn't feel as special if you have the same thing as everyone else. Whereas the Moser, that one, the Chronograph, was a limited edition. It was limited to, I think, 500 pieces. And it's a completely distinct design. Within this segment of integrated bracelet sports watches, there's nothing like it and that's something rare especially in these last few years as more and more companies have tried to get in on that pie that Patek Philippe and Audemars Piguet have been enjoying with their steel sports watches. On the inside it has the HMC 200 that's Moser's in-house caliber. It's completely theirs all the way down to the hairspring. They're one of the few companies that actually makes its own hairsprings. Even some of the most in-house integrated companies will still outsource the hairspring just because there's such difficult components to make. Next on the list, we have a new Omega Seamaster 300M Special Edition. This is the Nectin Edition. It's a special edition created to bring awareness to the Nectin effort, which is they're a non-for-profit research organization focusing on sort of cleaning up the oceans and protecting the marine environment. So definitely a very good cause. But if you look at how it looks, I think it looks amazing. What they've done is they've opted for a relieved bezel made in titanium while the rest of the watch is in steel and it's a no date. Now personally, I prefer my watches have a date and especially on the new 300M where they have the date at the six o'clock, it's a matching color date disc. I think it's usually quite low key, but I can't deny that having a nice clean dial with no date aperture, it does have a certain simplicity to it that is appealing. But for me, the big appeal is the bezel. I love how they've really leaned into the 90s history of this Seamaster design. It's really important to remember that in the 90s, relief bezels were all the rage. The original Yachtmaster coming out in 92 had one. The 50 Fathoms Trilogy had one. The original Ulysse Nadan Marine Diver had one. So I really like that they've brought it back to its 90s roots. And I think this would be a serious competitor for someone looking at a steel Yachtmaster. If you think about it, Rolex doesn't offer a black dial Yachtmaster in full steel and they don't offer a no-date Yachtmaster. So a great alternative, and of course on the inside, it's packed with technology with the Caliber 8806. It's Meta certified, COSC certified, anti-magnetic, silicon hairspring. You know what to expect from Omega. One thing I will point out though that is a bit of a concern is Omega seems to be going down the same route as they do with their Speedmaster in that they're just pumping out special editions. 
This new 300M generation is the third generation. It's been around for under three years. And they've already had three James Bond editions, the On Her Majesty's Secret Service, the one that just came out that looks like the On Her Majesty's Secret Service, but it's in platinum. And of course, the No Time to Die in full titanium on the mesh bracelet. And then now they have this Nectar edition. And then you have the titanium tantalum and sedna gold, which isn't a limited or special edition, but it is a material variant that you don't produce very much of. And also you have the full ceramic version with the titanium bezel. I just worry that Omega is really just spreading this collection out so much and creating so many special editions that aren't really that special when there's so many of them in such a short period of time as well. I hope they don't create fatigue for this collection. But I'd love to know in the comments what you think about Omega in general producing too many special editions for their watches. And then the last watch that I'd like to talk about is actually the reason I originally was going to do this video. So I think about a week and a half ago, I saw a post on LinkedIn by Georges Kern saying that there was going to be a new webcast summit showcasing new models or what I thought would be new models, plural. Much like the one they did at the beginning of the year where they released the new Chronomat, the Super Ocean Heritage 57, the Navitime 35, and their respective variants. However, this time around, it was just 11 minutes of one model, the Endurance Pro. Now, I'll admit, I'm not the target audience for the Endurance Pro. My idea of the great outdoors, especially before lockdowns and COVID, was my run outside to get to the gym. I'm not the type of person who will partake in an Ironman just because I'm not very outdoorsy. It's not the type of thing I would think about when I want to do a workout. But part of the people who do. But that aside, I do think that they've really nailed it in terms of hitting their target audience. I don't know how many pilots are still using a Navitimer. I don't know how many professional divers are still relying on a dive watch like the Super Ocean. However, I do think that this Endurance Pro could be quite useful for people partaking in triathlons and Ironmans. The chronograph obviously is still very useful for them to keep track of things. It has a pulsation scale so that they can keep track of their heart rate. But most importantly, and this is what I'm most excited about, is the use of bright light, which is a proprietary material that Breitling has made that is both lighter and stronger than steel and titanium. And this is an obvious use for it. Something where you would want something on your wrist that is extremely light. Now, will this perform better than an Apple Watch or a Fitbit? Probably not. But I think that for the athlete in this category that still likes watches and wants to be able to integrate watches as much as they can into their life, I think this is a great, great play. I don't know how big that market is, but it's given, but it must be big enough for Breitling to bother targeting it. Now, the last thing I'd like to talk about is the way that all these watches were released. Obviously, it's 2020. We are in that era where there's no more Basel World or SIHH. There's no more big trade shows that are physically done on one small period of time in the year and with a bunch of people there all in one go, they've been spread out. You have Mulder, which has released an entire collection that they started at the beginning of the year, and now they're pushing it again later in the year to let that hype and excitement spread out without having to wait until the designated release time that they would have had to wait for with an SIHH or a Baselworld, for example. You have Breitling, which were very early pioneers of this sort of online release with their original summit earlier this year and word from George Kern is that we'll have another one before the year's end. I believe he said it was going to be October or maybe it was December. I'll put a picture up of the comment. And then lastly, you have Omega, which is sort of carrying on with what it was doing last year. They haven't made a huge amount of noise with their new releases, but again, maybe it's because they're focusing on a more intimate relationship with their existing customers or with their ADs. Maybe they're depending more on their ADs to really push the narrative and push the messaging out versus just pushing it through press, through social media and through big events. In any case, I'd love to know your opinions in the comments below of these watches, which ones you like, and also what you think the future of the industry holds. Which of these sort of different formats have you preferred? Or do you want us to go back to something more similar to the pre-COVID era of where it was just one period of the year where we got everything, but there was a bunch of buzz and excitement. And of course, if you like this video, make sure you like it and share it. If you want to see all the infographics and the pictures that I take of watches, make sure you follow me on Instagram at Shaluso. And if you want to keep seeing new videos of watches, make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so you know when my next video comes out. In any case, thanks for watching this video and we'll catch you on the next one.